All right, so I'm Chris Littleberry, um, and this is um, Home Alone with Local Host. It's all about automating home defense. A little bit about me. Uh, I'm a senior penetration tester with Knowledge Consulting Group. Uh, we're a firm out of DC, and um, uh, I have to plug, we are hiring, so if you got skills, let us know. Um, and I like building stuff. So a um, couple of pictures there. It's a uh, Xbox Live controller that um, did a randomization thing on it so you can do rapid fire and it wouldn't be detected on Xbox Live because it had a, um, a randomizing uh, uh, cadence to it. And um, yeah, it's cheating. I used it once and then it just kind of sat on a shelf somewhere. But uh, that was one of my first like uh, roll your own Arduino sort of thing. So it was a proof of concept. And then the other picture is uh, swapping out a fifth gear in my car to get better mileage. So uh, pretty much anything I can do like with my hands is fun stuff. So. So quick disclaimer, um, during the talk, I'm going to be providing ideas, examples, codes, stuff like that that's worked for me, um, things that haven't worked, but um, uh, pretty much is kind of a trial, good Lord, uh, pretty much is like a trial and error thing. And uh, afterwards, definitely open to suggestions and questions. Um, in fact, really encourage it. I'd like to hear what uh, other folks have to say. Um, I'm not getting paid to endorse anything, so there's a bunch of off-the-shelf products that I'm going to be talking about that um, they work well. Um, some have their strengths and weaknesses, and we'll go over that, but um, nobody's paying me to be here. Um, I'm definitely not promising it into burglaries, especially if you live in some real high-risk areas. Um, sorry, you're screwed, but um, <laughs> at least you can, you, know, you can try to stack the odds in your favor sort of thing. Um, Definitely not advocating setting up booby traps in your house. Um, this is a big federal no-no. Um, when I was talking about doing this talk, I've had a lot of people approach me and they're like, yeah, you know, I want to, I want to, you know, build a boat and like, you know, have a spike pit and stuff. And, you know, <laughs> it should come flying down with spikes when you open the door a la home alone and stuff like that. And I'm like, you're, you'll, you'll go to prison. And, um, yeah, it's, so please, I, I, I'm not advocating that. Please don't do it. Um, yeah, don't do anything that can result in, uh, you know, hurting other people or property damage. Um, so if something is, um, you know, doing something to somebody's car or something like that that's on your property or something, just, I mean, just use your head. Don't, don't break shit. Um, and lastly, I'm going to be using a lot of examples from my place, uh, stuff that I've done. Please don't come pen test my home. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it, again, I would love to talk with folks afterwards and be like, you know, you know, have you thought about this? And be like, wow, I haven't thought about this. Thank you for, you know, let's open up a, a cool discussion about it instead of just showing up at my place at like one of the mornings standing over my bed freaking me out. So, um, <laughs> um, which some of y'all deviant off. bastards are probably in here that would do such a thing. So, um, yeah. So. Story starts out, once upon a time in South Texas. Um, I was living down in San Antonio. Um, I was living below the poverty line, and um, they, they like to have a great like tourism where you know they have the river walk, it's a nice place to visit, like it's a you know family affair and everything, and uh, you know everybody loves it. And before I start completely talking trash, is anybody here from San Antonio? No, but I'll say it sucks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so anybody else that is from San Antonio, I'm, I'm going to talk shit, so I apologize right now. But I spent about 10 years there, so I feel I'm adequately qualified to do so. Um, so the crime map of San Antonio is just terrible. Um, their, their local pastimes are uh, DUIs and home invasions. That's just what they're known for. Um, it's bad. So, um, yeah, they ranked uh, number three. I forget what year this was, but um, they were like the third least safe city in America. And uh, so, at the time, I had this little Honda Civic that, um, so, um, and again, audience participation here. Anybody have a Honda Civic? Or have had a Honda Civic? <laughs> yeah. Keep your hands up if it was stolen. You're my people, okay. So, uh, so at the time, uh, the, two th uh, the 1995 Honda Civic was the most stolen car in America, and I just happened to own the 1995 Honda Civic. 
Um, it had air conditioning. It got good mileage. Uh, I bought it for like fifteen hundred bucks. It got me from work, and like I mean, that's all I needed, right? And I came out one morning, and um, my doors are unlocked. People had gone through my stuff, but the car was still there. And I was like, "Yeah, this sucks. I I would like to do something about this. Like I." I should be able to outsmart them. Like I'm in IT. Like I, you know, I like soldering stuff. There's got to be a way to outsmart them. So I had an idea. So I took the. Um, they have a main fuel relay with them that's uh, up near the kick panel. So you unbolt it, and it's like a 12-pin connector. And you take this thing with you, and the car is just completely immobilized. And I mean. Sure, there's a chance that somebody, you know, breaking in is like, oh, gee, I happen to have one of those, and I'm going to look <laughs> under there. But um, I, you know, I rolled the dice. I figured it's a pretty safe bet. And, uh, and then I also got one of these really cheap alarms that uh, pages you. So, um, and I hooked it up without sirens, without lights, without anything. Uh, even went in and removed all the relays in it because um, they have relays to, uh, to trigger the, um, uh, the lights and the turn signals and things like that. So I removed everything. So all it does is page you. And um, so it's a, it's a bait car, sure. But um, you know, it, it was my bait car, and I wanted to be able to drive to work. And uh, so I kept it that way for, what, three months? And sure enough, it, uh, it worked. So um, early one morning, uh, the alarm goes off, and uh, I go running downstairs, and uh, there's two uh, respectable gentlemen going to work on my steering column, and um, I, I persuade them to um, to exit out of the vehicle, and one of them runs, and the other one, you know, tries to establish a you know a, a kind dialogue with me, and um, <laughs> um, uh, I was able to you know power persuasion. It's like you know maybe you should lay down on the ground, and you're just going to wait there for a bit until the cops come, and I was effective in doing so. The cops came out, they arrested him, and it was fantastic. And um, I was like, you know what? Um, I, I think it's time to move away from this shithole. Because um, <laughs> uh, other neighbors, uh, I, I have tons of anecdotal evidence that um, it was just, it was a bad place. Um, case in point, I found this on Reddit here. Um, I found this on Reddit, I think, like a year ago or so. And I saw this picture, and I was like, that looks a lot like my old apartment complex. And sure as shit, it was my old apartment complex. <laughs> and, um, uh, so yeah, somebody got upset, and so they uh, set their ex's car on fire, and it burnt down a few other things. And um, so it's just, it was terrible. So I moved up to a nicer area. And uh, actually, this picture is one of the like three times in the history of mankind that it snowed in San Antonio. And uh, by snow, I mean it just like dusted a tiny bit, and people were trying to sled on it, and um, <laughs> it just is, is terrible. But anyway, it was a nicer place. So uh, I moved up. Um, I moved up to the third floor. So I tried to get as high off the ground as possible because I read that okay, that's that's a safer thing to do. So if you uh, you know make it more difficult to get into, you know, lock all your exterior doors, even the sliding doors, even if you're up on you know the third floor, your balcony, that sort of thing. It's, you're stacking the odds in your favor. I mean, you're not gonna keep everybody out, but you're stacking odds in your favor. And so everywhere I looked, there was all these tips from cops, and the number one thing that kept popping up was make your home look occupied. Like, do stuff so that if people are coming by, knocking on your doors, looking in your windows and stuff, make it look like somebody's home. So have lights that come on on timers, and um, uh, you know, leave TVs on, just stuff that makes it look occupied. And you can see all the other stuff, you know, lock your doors, just basic stuff. But uh, so that, that got me thinking. So um, everybody's seen the movie Home Alone, right? Yeah. So uh, I, I kind of, yeah, steal off of that during this talk just a little bit. So um, anyway, um, so I thought, okay, I, I, I work kind of a weird schedule. I was working at night. I was working... Um, uh, you know, during the day sometimes, it's just it's all over the place, but I wanted something that would make the place look just normal all the time. So at the time, the cheapest home automation stuff out there was the X10 hardware. And I'm waiting to hear some groans or anybody. It, again, participation, anybody has done X10 before? Yeah, it, it's terrible. Um, <laughs> 
So it's been around since um, since the late '70s, and um, this really cheap hardware it works it works off of um, sending data over um, uh, your home power line, and the way it does it is um, it's encoded on a 120 kilohertz uh, carrier, which transmits uh, during the zero crossing, and um, it sucks so much that it sends the command three times every time it tries to send a command, just because it. It knows it's not reliable, and um, <laughs> but like if you're in a small apartment complex or something, or you know an older house where the wiring is not that complex, and um, it worked, and um, they had this god awful um, uh, GUI that you can um, you can program in um, uh, macros and certain things that uh, none of it really worked well, but uh, some of their timers actually had a really cool feature where it was a, uh, a security feature that you can time it for, let's say that you want everything to turn on at five o'clock uh, every day. So they had a security feature where it would turn on uh, anywhere between, I think like uh, 4.50 and 5.10. And it would be random every day. And that was the first time I saw anything like that. So I was like, okay, that's, you know, it's a cheesy company and the tech is terrible, but um, it, it's doing what I want to do. So eventually I moved to a house. Excuse me. So I moved to house um, and I started doing it with exterior lighting. Uh, so I had lights that would come on at different times, uh, you know, at night. Some of them would use uh, photovoltaic sensors, um, some of them using BX10, but um, pretty much still it wasn't anything special. But is this wood? So uh, knock on wood, everything, I mean, I never had any issues. Like it, you know, it seemed to be occupied all the time. Uh, neighbors got broken into, but mine, my, I, I didn't have any issues. So, uh, but eventually, I moved away. So uh, I moved back to uh, Colorado after a uh, ten-year hiatus. And I was like, uh, you know, got to set up a new place there. Crime's a lot better there, and I'm going to do it right this time. So, again, I'm going to do it right. <laughs> um, and of course, I have to advocate: uh, do not set up laser booby traps in your house. Um, it'd be cool as shit, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> what are they going to do? Um, so my my wish list was: uh, I wanted efficient lighting. Uh, most of the stuff out there for um, for doing wall switches and lights and things like that, uh, they're all incandescents. So we're all talking about you know 60, 80, 100 watt bulbs uh, per can. So you know your entire downstairs setup could be drawing. You know, the equivalent of a microwave or something, and uh, that just wasn't cool. So I wanted uh, I wanted efficient lighting. I wanted granular control over it. So I wanted to be able to uh, do individual zones, um, turn things on and off. You know, whenever I choose, have some sort of you know centralized way to control it, that sort of thing. Um, adaptive timing. So have things that uh, it's not always this, the same schedule with randomization and things. But so again. I, I wanted it to look like it was lived in as much as possible, and um, do some geofencing. Um, anybody done the uh, the F thin stuff? Hands? No. Okay. Uh, so there's some F thin uh, geofencing out there that um, it, it's supposed to work, and I've read that it's like a 20% success rate. Like you know, it you establish a geofence on your phone and then you leave and then uh, you know once you leave then certain actions happen and it like you know arms your security system or you know turns your uh, your lights off and stuff and so all these reviews I've read just people leave their house and the lights are just like yeah we're just gonna stay on till like 10 at night so um, so I wanted to do my own that like you know I had you know control over and uh, and yeah and the big thing is is I wanted to be able to do um, uh, defenses against uh, wireless home automation attacks. So everybody all around for uh, last year's uh, DEF CON. So DEF CON last year, uh, a gentleman did a presentation on the Z-Wave enabled door locks. Did you guys see those? Yeah. So uh, really quick, and, and, and if I'm wrong, yell at me. But um, so the Z-Wave enabled uh, door locks, they're encrypted. And instead of breaking the encryption, he just did a replay attack against it. So he didn't have to do anything special. He just was able to replay the exact same thing over RF. And the door lock was like, hey, welcome home, buddy. And, um, <laughs> um, and everybody was just, you know, holy shit. And um, 
funny anecdote, like a week after that, I had some dude come to my door, like trying to sell that because like uh, Comcast and a bunch of other places are trying to like uh, build out their home security system and, and, you know, and have that sort of thing where it's on your smartphone and, you know, it's like, gee, I can look at all these cameras in my house and I know when my kid's coming home and I can spy on my baby at night with infrared cameras and, you know, just straight up Skynet shit, but, you know, they, they love it. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, look, I can open up my garage or I can open up, you know, I can unlock my front door. And that just seemed like a terrible thing to me. So I want to be able to defend against that. And um, not only that, but if somebody really wants to get in, um, it's usually just going to be a smash and grab. So if you have, you know, a great alarm system, if you have uh, just, you know, the big giant ADT sign out, you know, prominently displayed in your front yard, just like, you know, please, please don't screw with this house. Like, if they really want to, they're going to do it anyway. Uh, I'm sure everybody in this room has uh, has friends that uh, you know. Just during the day, people have kicked in their front door, alarm goes off, they grab a handful of stuff and just run. Um, that's just how it is. And uh, so I wanted to be able to do something that would immediately react to that and try to mitigate you know what they can carry. So if they kick in the door, alarm goes off and they're freaking out, and then something that they've never seen before happens inside the house that might be like, you know what, maybe we should, you know, GTFL. So that's what I wanted to do. That was my wish list. So one of the first things I did was um, uh, Wi-Fi enabled light bulbs. Uh, did anybody get in on the LifeX Kickstarter? No? Awesome. So um, they did a Kickstarter a while back. It took a while for them to ship the bulbs. They had a whole bunch of uh, uh, regulator uh, regulation things to do. But um, in the grand scheme of things, they they're Wi-Fi enabled LED light bulbs, and um, their big claim to fame is they'll do a thousand lumens. They are bright as shit. Um, they'll also do um, full uh, full color. Their color representation is fantastic if you're into that. Uh, you know, if, uh, the picture I have there with the blue is my living room, which is two of them uh, up in cans in my ceiling. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's cool. Um, side note of that is, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, if the alarm goes off, uh, one of the things it can do is the whole house can start flashing red. So, <laughs> um, I mean, I mean, you know, upstairs, downstairs, like I, I have an entryway chandelier and everything that's, that's got the shit in it. I mean, I mean, the whole damn house will just like, I mean, straight out of aliens sort of thing. We're just everything. If, if, if I can rig up a fog machine too. <laughs> leave her alone, you bitch. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, they're great bulbs. They're absolutely great bulbs. Uh, at full power, they draw 17 watts, so that fits into, um, yeah, uh, it fits into their, um, uh, you know, I'm not drawing a ton of power. Um, and you can dim them down. You can do it all through software. Um, they recently released an API, so uh, any, um, any Ruby fans out here, anybody that codes in Ruby? Good, good. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anybody that codes in Python? You my people. All right. Um, so, and, and I'll, I'll get to that here in a bit with the open source. But there's, there's several different libraries out there to work with it. The official API for them is in Ruby. Uh, it's not that bad to work with. You can port it over to Python. Um, but, yeah. The downside to these bulbs is that they are large. They, they have some heft to them. So you can't put them in like normal uh, fixtures that, uh, that sit sideways. Um, yeah, they'll like start sagging down, they'll come in contact with the globe, it just, it looks terrible. And um, yeah, and they heat up a bit, so you can't enclose them. So the other option is the, uh, the Philip Hue. Um, Really easy to work with. They have a great API. Uh, their API has Python. So, again, the Python people, yeah. Um, even lower power consumption, 8.5 watts at full brightness. Uh, they're a little bit cheaper. The only problem is, is that their power output is not the same. You put three of them in a, uh, in a fixture, and it's going to be like, you know, three 60-watt light bulbs. So it's not bad. It depends on where you want to put them, but it, it's a good option. Um, 
and their color representation isn't as good as the LifeX ones. But again, if you're just looking for lighting up a, you know, a, a side room, a dining room, or something like that, if you want uh, to be able to, you know, control that remotely and still have the thing flash red and just freak the hell out of people, then it's a fantastic choice. Um, just a couple pictures real quick. This was uh, 4th of July at my place that uh, the camera didn't really do it justice. Um, the purple ones are actually blue and then the red ones are red and, um, and that was both LifeX and, uh, and Hue bulbs. And then my living room just messing around and uh, yeah, any uh, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans out there, that was during my proof of concept. What's that? <laughs> We're hiring. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so a couple other devices are out there. Um, uh, Wemo devices. Uh, show of hands. Anybody familiar with those? Yeah. So they had some vulnerabilities that came out uh, last year that uh, really not good. Where um, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, <laughs> so they had them come out last year where there was a um, uh, a vulnerability with them where if they rapidly cycled them, um, uh, there was a hack where you could rapidly cycle them. If it was uh, hooked up to some sort of ductive load, like a um, uh, uh, like a motor or you know, something like that that uh, initially takes like uh, a really large amperage and then like settles down. Are we distracting you? Yeah. No, you're just concerning me. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, appreciate it. All right. <clears throat> to our first time speaker. Thank you. <laughs> We've been doing this for four days, like three we don't shots, sleep. Yeah. three talks every hour. I, I've lost track at this point. I really want to give me one of those little rascals because, yeah, I'm, I'm fat and lazy and just seems fantastic. So, um, anyway, the Wemo devices, they, uh, they had a published exploit out there for them where, um, like I said, you can rapidly cycle them and depending on what device is hooked up, it can make them catch fire and burn your house down, which is, um, it's bad. So um, they have since pushed out a firmware update for them, but um, room int is, is that they're still not that secure. So um, what I've read is uh, lock down IPv6 on your routers, uh, don't let anything out and uh, just, you know, lock down everything that you have. Uh, with that said, they're extremely useful for if you have exterior lighting where um, you have um, uh, like, uh, where the CFL bulbs. So like if you have CFL bulbs like all around your house and then you can hook up one of these switches. So you're talking about what, like 20 watts worth of draw uh, all night and then you can switch it with one of these switches. Um, Problem being is that they have timers built in. They, uh, so they have their own app and then they have their own timers built in, both of which just completely suck. Um, their app is, is really not reliable and uh, their timers, uh, well they work sometimes. Um, if you have, uh, let, like say your, uh, your external lights, you want them to turn on at eight o'clock at night and you want to keep them on until six in the morning. So when it comes up on midnight, they'll shut off for a few seconds. And then like midnight, five seconds later, they'll come back on. And there's like no rhyme or reason for it. So if somebody is, you know, casing your house or whatever, it's like, yeah, it's a, that's a pretty good indicator, so. Um, and again, yeah, terrible security. Um, there's a link to um, uh, that exploit on there too, and the slides will be available and everything, so. So, needed to create a home defense server. Um, needed to be available 24-7, low power consumption, um, hook it up to a, uh, uh, an UPS, uh, integrate with um, analog and digital sensors, so be able to uh, you know, deploy your own sensor network, and um, uh, integrate with your existing uh, home security system. 
So it would be more of a supplement thing. I mean, you can build one on your own um, and you know have it respond and do stuff, but um, I'm of the mindset where I like to have somebody monitoring that uh, you know if they call the cops, uh, cops are going to come out. Whereas if you know I see something and I get a text message and I'm just like, yeah, hey, I'm Chris and I built built this Rude Goldberg system at my house where all these flags and shit happened and I swear there's somebody in the house, can you go check it out? And they're going to be like, sir, this is 911, don't ever call back again. <laughs> so um, if it supplements your home security system, at least like you have a little bit of clout to that. And uh, you can integrate in, um, I think I have it um, a couple slides down on how to integrate it in. But uh, again, the Raspberry Pi was a great choice. Um, again, how many people mess with Raspberry Pi? They're fantastic. They're just, they're, they're wonderful. Um, had a little experience with pies before. Um, I built a Wi-Fi enabled barbecue smoker. Um, just because, shit, I don't know if I could. So um, uh, I got, I got uh, some meat probes and then a, a probe for a GE oven that I found because like all the other uh, thermal probes I can find would just completely you know, melt and be worthless after I think like 240 degrees. So I found one that was good for like 400 and mounted that in there, run it through a, um, uh, what, a 10-bit ADC, and then ran it off of the Pi, put a Rails server on there. What's that? Sorry, I thought I heard his question. Sorry, ADD. Um, and so I put a Rails server on the front end because I had some Rails experience at the time and I just didn't know any better. So. Um, Again, any Rails coders here? <laughs> good, good. Um, but it worked, and it was it was one of those proof of concepts where it's like I could build, you know, not only you know the sensor portion of it, but I can have a front end writing on the exact same piece of hardware, have it all self-contained, have it on wireless, and just do fun stuff with it. So, creating the home defense server. Um, anybody familiar with uh, wiring in just regular home security systems? where you have like the long line of uh, sensors and everything has to be closed and everything for it to be okay and uh, yeah. So there's two different ways of doing it. it. You can have like a normally closed loop or uh, normally open and uh, either way most of the newer ones you can program them to, um, to do either way. So stick a Pi online with that and uh, put it in the mix and um, either put a relay in or a transistor or however you want to wire it in and have it connected to its own network. So let's say that you have your own um, uh, PIR sensor, so your own motion sensor, or your own, you know, what have you, uh, something's gonna happen, that you can then send a signal to that Pi, it can trip it, and then fire off the, uh, the security system. Uh, another thing you can do is uh, they have little panic buttons, uh, the wireless panic buttons. You can take one of those apart and solder onto the leads of that and then just run transistor over that and if something happens then you can hit that. And then when it goes into the alarm company, it's going to come in as a silent alarm but instead of a, you know, oh, there's a motion somewhere or, you know, uh, you know, a door opened or something like that. It's going to come straight across as like, you know, silent alarm, old Betsy fell down or old Betsy is being, you know, robbed by hoodlums, whatever, we should probably get out there. I don't know, that was my thinking. But um, so there's a lot of ways to graft it in. And again, I, I highly recommend grafting it into an existing alarm system. So to bring it all together, um, there's a lot of open source code out there for all these different techs. So um, uh, Magic Monkey did uh, the original reversing of LifeX protocol for uh, the big giant uh, LED bulbs. and. Um, Great, great tool. Uh, the only thing is it wouldn't do multiple bulbs at a time. So if you want to flash your entire downstairs red, it would be like one bulb, one bulb, one bulb, one bulb. But then sometimes one of them wouldn't respond and just kind of sucked. Um, and then, um, uh, no, I'm sorry, he was the uh, the JavaScript version of that. And then uh, Sharp uh, did the LifeX Python, which was built off of that library. Um, later on in, uh, of this year, actually, LifeX finally came out with their official API, which is written in Ruby, um, which we've all been over this. Um, so you can make it work. Um, it, it, it's a good API. I just, I have this thing against Ruby. And um, there is, I can't pronounce this guy's name or the project name, but they have an API for the Wemos devices and uh, it works just fantastic. Uh, so not only do they have code support, but they have command line support. 
and it's it's great stuff. So you can control all these things just from uh, from command line or different scripts. So from there, I created a front end service where I wanted something lightweight uh, to control all the stuff and just kind of have a front end. Um, you can do Rails. Rails sucks. Uh, it's heavy. Um, Python has Flask. It's uh, it's a great front end. Ruby has Sinatra. It's pretty much the exact same thing, only it's written in Ruby. And uh, as we've been over before, Ruby's terrible. And um, and then I've created backend services for each of uh, each of the texts being used, and they're their own services, and they're on their own um, they're on their own ports. So if one of them fails, then just that that service fails, and so I don't lose everything in the house, sort of thing. Um, and then also I wanted to have a, a database to keep track of it all, and I ended up putting up that database on a separate Pi, and I used a Redis database, which is really lightweight, really fast, and I mean it's it's not that complicated. I wasn't looking for you know giant enterprise level stuff. I just wanted something quick, so I put one on a separate Pi that was in a different room and uh, had a couple sensors on it, but nothing really taxing. Uh, if you end up going that route, I uh, highly recommend uh, you put external swap on a traditional hard drive. So get a powered USB hub and uh, put a hard drive on it and set up swap. Because otherwise, even if you have you know, a, great, uh, a great SD card in that Pi, uh, if you look at the logs, it's going to be sitting there just swapping out all the time. And all those read-write cycles are just, they're, they're hell on those cards. So. Um, and then finally create a, uh, a monitoring service with alerts and, um, uh, you know, when the services go down, be nice to know about it. So, and again, all the code uh, that I've been talking about here is going to be available on uh, my GitHub after the conference. Um, I'm going to do a disclaimer right now that my code is terrible. Uh, I'm not a developer. Again, I'm a pen tester. Um, so my code works. It's not pretty. And... For the ones that are professional devs and they like nice, clean, polished code, it, it may be offensive to you. So just, <laughs> but it works. Um, so moving on, I wanted to be able to uh, to determine if I'm walking into a room and things happen. Like I want I want my place to know if I'm there or not. So uh, originally, what I wanted to do was uh, do Bluetooth. So I wanted to pair to my phone and know that if I'm walking into a room. Um, excuse me, that it's going to see my phone and be like, oh, okay, he's here, and then, you know, whatever else happens, update it in the database that I'm there, so certain other things that are going on will know to look for me there and that sort of thing. So I played around with it, and it was kind of a pain in the ass because um, you have to create a connection, you have to open up a connection with it, so you have to pull the device after it's been paired. While it's being pulled, then you have to um, uh, do the, uh, the request for the RSSI. So the signal strength identifier. So you do that, so you pull it, and while it's being pulled, say, oh, by the way, what's the signal strength? It'll come back with a number, and then from there you can say, okay, you know, the phone is within this amount of distance. And you put a couple of those in different rooms, and then you can determine where something is. The problem is, is that if you get a little too aggressive with that, it will brick your um, uh, wireless interface on your phone. So not just Bluetooth, but um, uh, just regular 802.11 as well. And that was a fun one to find out when I was debugging this. But, um, but it worked for a bit. Um, so from there, I went to, uh, to try to uh, do it with, uh, with 802.11. So as everybody knows, your phones will beacon out 802.11 beacons every, what, 60 seconds uh, if you're not doing anything. But as soon as you, know, you turn them on and start doing stuff, it's your, uh, your MAC address is going to be all over the place. So. Um, there's some command line utilities where you can you can go through and um, and parse out what Mac is being seen and what signal strength it is. So if you have neighbors and stuff that um, you know you don't care about, they're going to be they're going to be lower signal strength, and you can you can grab that out or what have you. But if you have a uh, a certain set that you want to keep track of, so let's say you know your uh, significant other, kids, whatever, like you can have a list of things that uh, that it'll look for. Um, if you're really curious about it, do the, uh, that T-Shark command on the very bottom, and uh, it'll bust out just way more information than you'll ever want to know about wireless packets, and you can just do all sorts of magic with it. Uh, I ended up doing it the Python way with, uh, with Scapy, and um, it's ugly. It's very, very ugly, but it works. And um, 
so what I have it doing is I have a flat file of MAC addresses that I want to keep track of. And so it fires up and uh, starts looking for those whenever it sees it. It updates a, um, uh, the Redis database that, okay, it's been seen, and then at what time it's been seen. And then I have a separate process that goes through the database to look at those timestamps, and if it's outside of a certain time, then, okay, it hasn't, um, uh, it hasn't been seen in this amount of time, so then I'm not there. Other rules now apply. So lights are going to be turning off, um, you know, at these predetermined times, they're still within random windows and that sort of thing. So that way, it knows if I'm home, so I'm not sitting there watching TV with, you know, lights and stuff on, and I'm in the middle of something, and then just my whole living room goes dark, and, you know, it's just, it ruins the mood, right? Um, so again, proximity uh, monitoring, um, looks for mobile phone max, um, calculate signal strength, yeah, I just went over all that, actually. Adaptive scheduling. Um, so I created a smart cron system where um, everybody familiar with uh, Weather Underground? Everybody used that before? So they have a fantastic API that's free for developers that um, uh, every day at one o'clock my system will pull down what the uh, solar schedule is for the day. So we'll pull down what the sunrise, sunset, and that sort of thing is. And uh, from there, it'll block off uh, randomized times of um, uh, okay, I want to turn off my outside lights sometime around uh, sunrise, turn off, um, or turn them on somewhere around um, sunset and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it, it basically shifts every day. And, um, and then there's also things built in where towards the end of the day, it'll take a look at cloud cover and UV index and stuff and then kind of move some interior lights up depending on if it's dark out and things like that. So uh, uh, again, I, I have all the code that's going to be on uh, GitHub. So for the fun stuff, uh, defenses against wireless base attacks. Um, again, y'all saw the Z-Wave attack uh, last year. Did anybody go to the fox hunting uh, thing on uh, Thursday? It was like really early on Thursday. Um, I went to the Rapid 7 party before on Wednesday night and I just was not able to get here, so no. So fox hunting is uh, RF direction finding. It's really, really cool stuff. And so uh, the only way I could think of to defend against uh, uh, these sort of Z-Wave attacks where it's a replay attack or if it's somebody trying to jam uh, 345 meg uh, wireless sensor data for some of the newer, um, uh, newer alarm systems that use those is to be able to determine if somebody's transmitting on the band and where they're transmitting from. And uh, is anybody familiar with the Doppler effect? So for the ones that aren't, um, ambulance goes by, high pitch as it's coming, and then regular pitch as it goes by, and then lower pitch as it goes by. Um, same thing will happen with RF. So you have a phase antenna array, and you, uh, you have a signal come in, you switch through it fast enough, you can get a pretty good idea as to where it's coming from. And um, so I have a setup that uh, works against uh, 345 and 900 megs. And uh, so if anything does key up and it is outside of a uh, uh, certain parameters for, uh, for where it's located, I have it actually set past my front door a little bit. So anything that's outside of my house is going to pick up on. And um, the way it does that is it uses the uh, Agrillo DF message format. And uh, whereas it's uh, bearing and then signal quality, uh, the system I'm using is called the PicoDop, and uh, it's just fixed at seven for the signal quality, but I really don't care. I just want to know where it is. So um, the, uh, the text there you see is an actual uh, output from uh, a test I was doing. And those 327, 316, 312, 319, those are all numerical, uh, numerical bearings off of the antenna array of uh, where the signal's coming from. So like I was able to sit outside with like a, um, uh, what do you got? One of the extra sensors, one of the 345 sensors, sit outside and key it off and then suddenly the system says, hey, there's something coming from outside and um, yeah, that's not kosher. So um, anyway, you can pipe that into a database as well. You can have that uh, do timestamps on it. So if it's coming in a whole bunch, you'll know somebody is jamming. If it's coming in just once or twice, but it's from outside, you'll know that somebody's trying to do a Z-Wave attack, and I mean, the possibilities are endless. Uh, if you put two of these together and then correlate the two, you have real-time triangulation. And 
So it's fun. And lastly, um, again, a lot of folks want to just kick in the front door. Alarm goes off. They don't care. Um, they want to steal things. So um, the best thing you can do is try to make it an inhospitable environment for them. So they want to be quiet. They want to be anonymous. They want to just get in and out and, you know, nothing happened, right? So uh, I talked about earlier on where the whole house will flash red. Um, that's a really good way to do it, especially if it's at night. So just a whole suburban house is just, you know, horrible. Um, you can flash the exterior lights as well. Um, do something that is going to be electronically activated and do something in a safe way. Um, again, safe way, nobody wants to be sued. Um, one of the things you can do is hook up like a 12 volt solenoid for uh, like car poppers, uh, like for door locks or for people that shave uh, car handles and stuff like that. They have these, uh, these real, real high powered uh, solenoids that you can you know, either push pull with. So have it set up somewhere to knock over something heavy. So you know, alarm goes off and people come in and then all of a sudden they, you know, something upstairs and that's gonna, okay, you know, the hell was that sort of thing. It'll buy you a few seconds, right? Um, and again, don't create anything that can do harm. With that said, um, <laughs> um, so this is purely theoretical here. I, I, I don't want anybody to ever want to do something like this, especially indoors, because it makes fire and shit, and it's bad. So um, everybody knows, don't do this. Um, don't build your own fireworks either. Uh, you can go buy, you know, firecrackers around Fourth of July. They're dirt cheap. Yes. Do not break these open. Do not combine them all into something. Don't just. I mean, again, this is Chris Littleberry at DEF CON 2014 saying, "Do not create your own fireworks." So they make these things uh, for model rockets. I got a good friend of mine, he's huge into model rockets. I was trying to figure out a way to light these things on fire. And he's like, dude, just use a rocket igniter. I was like, tell me more about this. And um, <laughs> so this is um, uh, the, the middle thing there with the little black and white. And all it is is just some wires that come in and then a really thin wire at the end and then like a little sparkler material on top of it. And uh, what happens is, is that you put uh, power into it, it shorts out, it ignites the sparkler bit, and then, um, excuse me, it creates fire. And um, if you have it taped up to um, uh, a bunch of uh, firecrackers like that, then um, yeah, it, it, it'll go boom. Um, for the sake of argument, if I were going to do something like this, I would do them one on one. Um, I would have a separate channel for each one. So fire one off individually, so it would be like a bang, 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 bang. So not something that sounds like, you know, the kid from Home Alone put something in a thing and just lit it all on fire. Um, have it sound something realistic. But inside a closed space, it's going to be stupid loud, and um, it's going to get a lot of attention, and they're probably going to leave. Um, so again, your mileage may vary. It may be completely illegal. Do it somewhere where it's not going to catch anything on fire. Once these things go off, they fly in the air. Uh, I set one off outside just testing this out, and like I found them on the roof of my car. Um, it, it, it's a lot of shit. Um, and to give you an idea. So that was just 12 volts with, uh, with just that one strand that, uh, that you saw before. Um, and again, you can do that with a Pi with just, um, you know, just a MOSFET, drive a, um, drive a relay and just apply 12 volts to it and boom, it goes. Uh, so from here, um, I don't have any Z-Wave integration yet just because it's not open source and the shit's expensive. Um, I would like to learn to do that. Uh, I really want to integrate uh, SDR scanning into uh, the 345 band for all the, uh, the wireless um, uh, the wireless sensors and that sort of thing uh, to be able to read those on the fly as well and not just the hard line loop stuff. Uh, if there's any SDR guys out there that um, know how to pull information out of a 345 meg uh, uh, AM signal and actually use it, please come talk to me afterwards because uh, that's something I've been struggling with and that'd be awesome. Um, 
And uh, there's also this uh, 345 900 meg uh, separate uh, receiver and transmitter that 2 gig sells that uh, I wanted to go spend some time with the hardware hacking village to see if I can figure out how that works. That came in like a day before I got on the plane to come here, so I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. And uh, again, I want to hear ideas from you guys. So uh, if you guys have awesome stories of, you know, that don't include digging giant pits with spikes at the bottom and then, you know, harvesting their meat for post-apocalyptic memes. <laughs> no, no. Um, question? So when it opens your door, do you have any way to reset so shut the door after they leave to hurry? Shut the door after the... Yeah, they, they, they come in the house, right? Do you have any way to reset the doors? Like, give a five-man entry or to shut the doors? No. Um, and that may be a good idea, but that also could be some sort of booby trap because, again, that whole theoretic firework thing that if somebody were to implement such a thing, not that I would, but if it did, and then the door was shut and they were not able to, you know, have a timely egress outside of the establishment and they were to maybe be burned alive, that would be bad. <laughs> so... Anyway, I'm running out of time. I apologize. Um, any questions, there's my, uh, there's my Twitter. And again, the, the GitHub will be up there and email address and all that. So come find me afterwards.